What's up, Ross? Yo, how you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, yeah, doing great. Good to connect. Dude, so glad to have you on today, man. Really pumped. Yeah, likewise. I'm. Uh, I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but love what you've done. A huge fan, you know. Uh, consumer from an entrepreneurial standpoint. So first off, you know, bravo for all the for all the trailblazing you've done in the space. Thank you, man. Well, I feel the same way. I'm, uh, I'm super pumped for this episode. Just, just to kick off, guys, we've got Ross. Is it McKay or Mackey? Or how do I pronounce your last name? Yeah, it's, it's Mackay, you know. Uh, Mackay. Just moving... want to make sure I say it right. <laughs> Scottish originally. Um, but, you know, don't, don't feel bad. No one gets it right here. I'll take whatever. There you, there you go. Ross Mackay, um, the co-founder of Daring Foods. Um, amazing new entrant to the plant-based meat category. They're making uh, a plant-based chicken product uh, for the freezer aisle, which will also eventually be in fresh. Keep an eye out, but really pumped for episode 19 to kind of showcase your story. Ross, let's, let's keep it high level and casual, man. Where are you from? You're obviously not, not from the U.S. Um, Want to hear about your story and just how, how did you make your way into this crazy world of, uh, of CPG? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, you know, and likewise, I'll, I'll keep it relatively high level, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders along with my closest friend, Elliot. Um, and, you know, much like many founders probably, you know, like yourself or on this podcast, this business has really been built for real need, uh, being, you know, a consumer of plant-based for, for more than six years. I haven't eaten meat for a long, long time. And I felt like there was just a real gap in, in, in the plant base for something more focused around health. You know, that's still the the number one purchasing decision driving the category, you know, animal welfare and environmental being, you know, second and third, but we're so disassociated from that as consumers. And we set out to do something that we felt that was needed and missing from the space, which was a clean label plant-based item and, and focused on the the world's favorite protein, which is, which is chicken still, you know, it's faced unrivaled growth for decades as, as being the healthiest protein. And, and we don't believe it is. So, um, you know, fast forward three years in development. We launched this year in March and uh, we're really excited to be in the CPG space and, and doing something great. So can you talk to me a little bit about like what, what made you go fully plant based like early days? You know, were you uh, pretty focused on clean eating or uh, how, how did that kind of come about? <sighs> that's, a, that's a great question. And, you know, back to my earlier years, uh, I, much you know i love sport i played high level sport for my country tennis was was a sport of choice for me i was fortunate enough to to represent my country uh in tennis um and you know i think naturally because of that sports nutrition movement just became such an integral part of my life um and coupled with that you know nutrition was largely focused around protein consumption you know you got to get in x amount of protein every couple of hours and naturally that came from lean sources like turkey fish or chicken um so i've always been interested in that and you know fast forward you know years from there i started to really question the amount of protein and the sources of protein i was consuming you know as an individual uh, which led me into believing there was there, there was other options but yeah absolutely i've always been interested in, in health nutrition Gotcha. And so what were some of your go to's like as you were snacking, uh, preparing for, you know, matches? Uh, was it just lean turkey and, and you know, eventually you, you were fed up or, um, you know, was there a, a, basically a transition where you're like, man, I'm, I'm done with all animal based products. So I'm going to I'm going to try something different. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like like, you know, it became slightly monotonous. You're you're just consuming, you know, uh, I, got, I suppose prepared meals every couple hours, you know, we we all know those guys that do that. That that was me, and um, I suppose I actually went cold turkey around sort of six, seven years ago. Um, you know, I said enough's enough. I think I I, I noticed and read there was some um, data that showed plant based reducing your meat intake can can actually be be beneficial to health, nutrition, and, and performance. And and the deeper we dive as entrepreneurs into you know one point we start to understand and learn about, wow, like it can benefit this and there's also environmental impact. And then couple that with just the growing awareness and surgeons for, for other category leaders like Beyond and Impossible, growing the overall category and awareness for consumers, um, you know, I became pretty, pretty prevalent that uh, this was the future of food. 
I love it. I mean, I think I think you're right. It's it's amazing when you see when you see a the, the successes of of other plant based conglomerates like Beyond and Impossible, like you mentioned. Plus, a lot of companies going public. Um, it's it's an interesting time for food and beverage brands. The scale that we're able to kind of build so rapidly and so quickly. Yeah. Um, so I guess you know I know you're you're a serial entrepreneur. You founded a couple other companies before Daring. Let's really quickly. I'd love to hear. What were, were those also in, in, in consumer packaged goods? Were they in, in other industries entirely? Like what, what were you doing prior? Yeah, high level, I was living in the Middle East in Dubai, actually, uh, from 21 years old, 29 today. Um, and I just had noticed there was a, a, a slight, um, I say, gap for menswear. Um, you know, you have 2 million people. There was 100,000 Emirati locals with you know, around a million Westerners that couldn't at the time 10 years ago consume or buy pure menswear, you know, t-shirts like the one you're wearing, shirts like this. So working with a co-manufacturer in, in Asia to, to bring essentially my own brand and, and other brands um, to market there. So scaled that business, you know, through through dot com and through, econ, uh, through retail partners like Harvey Nichols, Saks Fifth Avenue over there in the Middle East and uh, got to the point where I'd raised a little bit of capital and, and exited on that company. So I think, you know, fundamentally what that taught me was, you know, um, building business, working with co-manufacturers, bringing products to market through different channels. And, um, and, and fundamentally what it taught me was uh, moving forward for me to really get involved in another business. I had to do what I believed in. This was gap in the market opportunity. Let's try and make some, some, some money here. Um, and I'm not afraid to say that and fast forward to where we are today, you know, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is so glorified. I think if, if you are going to launch a company, you have to, you know, have that burning fire that this is, there's no plan B. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So there was some successes and some, some failures that I learned and, you know, moving forward, um, this would be the, the, the company that I'm most proud of clearly. There's no question that building an, one successful company is going to translate to higher probability of success and daring. So that's awesome that you were in menswear. It sounds like you enjoyed it, but it wasn't something, you know, after a certain point, you know, you're kind of tapped out in terms of like being passionate about that. Would, would you agree? Yeah, so, definitely. You're going to, you're going to face critique, challenge, you know, conflict. And if you don't really believe in it, naturally the, the business is going to come to a position where it is no more, but uh, we, we had some success and I'm, I'm happy that I was able to invest into, into, into launching Daring. Awesome. So you were in Dubai. That's amazing. Sounds like you were, you're traveling a lot. How did you meet Elliot and where did Daring really like first beta of the, of the product come to come to life? Yeah. So Elliot, my co-founder, CEO, you know, being a lifelong friend, I suppose uh, to take it back, we met 10 years ago in Paris in a store called Colette. And I'm not, I'm not sure Dude, if you're familiar. Love Colette. Yeah. Yep. You know, uh, you know, the there Mecca, you um, and he was working for LVMH there. You know, I would say what is known as sort of the plug in, in Paris. Um, we, we met through mutual friends. I came to him with, you know, my previous company and, and, and he helped me uh, tackle the market, you know, find route to market there, you know, fast forward a couple of years of just staying in touch fast, you know, uh, you know, through business and holidays. And, and, and actually it was about sort of six years ago where funnily enough, we were both starting to, in, to go through this plant-based transition, you know, uh, him in Paris and me in the Middle East. Uh, we, we chopped it up about similar stories and similar sticking points through our transition. Um, and we got together late 2017, him, his high level background in finance and operations and, and me, my passion for, for, for business and starting businesses. And we looked at, you know, the opportunity with, with daring, you know, you'll know it didn't start what it was today. We've gone through, you know, a million different directions and we've, we've, we've chopped and changed, but we knew that there was there was a, a real need to do something in the in the plant based meat space and and in particular chicken. So, you know, working uh, we will say none of our background is in food science and, and product development. Um, but I think one of the the advantages of of uh, a lot of entrepreneurs is being able to partner and find people around you and surround yourself with people that are experts in the field. So we we working with food scientists in the UK and in Europe. Um, to really get a better understanding of the plant kingdom and what was needed and to formulate something which we had, you know, envisioned. Um, and it was you know, late 2017, we got together and, you know, 2020 in March that we, we brought the product to market. 
So something that's really interesting about, you know, what you guys are building is the ingredient stack and trying to create a less processed version of some of these uh, plant-based meats that are on the market. You know, I know that you guys have uh, double the amount of fiber, you know, way less fat. Um, you know, you're mainly focusing, correct me if I'm wrong, on a soy protein concentrate uh, with some flour oil. Um, can you talk a little bit about the engineering side of the food and what some of the issues are with some of these larger conglomerates that went to market really fast? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think one of the things that we focused on um, is, well, actually our North Star in building this out has been health. I and mean, if you look at the consumers driving this, what we call the plant curious internally as a company, um, the number one decision was health. So when you look at the products on the market thus far, you know, consumers are able to touch them once, twice, now and again, it's, it's not a daily purchasing decision for consumers plant-based meat yet. There's still uncertainty, there's still untrust, and largely that comes down to a couple of things. You know, taste, texture, but primarily macronutrients and ingredient lists. You know, the, the pushback on meat is high, but the pushback on meat alternatives is even higher now. What is this? What is this really good for me? What is this carrageen maldedextrin that I see in this ingredient list? Yes. I get, I get it. It's good for the environment and it's better for animals, but is it really better for my health? But understanding that 65 to 70% of consumers were looking for to reduce their meat intake from health, there was a contradiction there. Um, so we looked at what health represents, which is ingredient list. You know, we all turn to the back of CPG products and think, right, fundamentally, what is the number one ingredient? What is the, the how many ingredients does it have? And then second of all, when you look at chicken, if you look to replicate that, you have to tap into macronutrients, protein, carbs, fiber, fat, et cetera. So, you know, we've built this business to, to take on chicken. We had to do that through, through macros and we had to tackle the number one decision, which was health. So we, we really fit at that intersection of, of health and taste. Um, and then in terms With of chicken too, it's so important that you guys nail like the consistency because anything that's tasting off or i mean meat especially is that's so so crucial yeah i mean you know chicken is a is a, is a phenomenally versatile protein you know we can bake it fry it you know barbecue season you know it's deemed to be the healthiest protein in the world due to its high protein low carb low fat uh balance so if you're looking to convert that customer which is our tam eventually right we want to take away chicken from the food system how do we get there we have to deliver on a, pro a, pro a product which not only delivers from a macro standpoint but on a taste and texture you know we we know as uh, as cpg founders if you're not having celsius rate because it's not tasting good you know you're, you're not going to have a sustainable business so Managing that, you'd, you'd be surprised how often that goes <laughs> that's, out the window. <laughs> yeah, you, you're you're right. I mean, long term, uh, we'll, we'll see the results. But you know, yep. at, at the same time, um, balancing that is always something uh, which is which is hard because you're trying to balance health and you're trying to balance taste and no sacrifice of of certain ingredients. And when we look to developing future alternative proteins in the space like pea and so on, we always find that equilibrium of, of taste and health. So. Yeah, I mean, what, what I will say is we're, 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 we're four or five months into trading. You know, we're very early, but we're, we've got some big ambitions. I love that. I love that. And can, can you say, like, correct me if I'm wrong, what are some of the ingredients? We don't need to call out other players at all, but um, I've, I've seen the following when people go to buy plant-based meats or try them. Is they just, they're like, well, plant-based meats aren't even, uh, you know, I'd rather eat regular meat because plant-based yeah. meats are actually worse for you. Now, I, that's easy to debunk, and that's, it's, there are a lot of these camps that will fall into quickly reacting to that. Like, what exactly, why, like, why is a methyl cellulose or a wheat gluten or some of these products, can you, can you talk a little bit about why they're not as great for you or just the science there? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. So there's a number of ingredients that we probably consume as consumers every single day without realizing. And I think you, of all people, will know – why bigger corporate traditional food businesses use them because it comes down to margin it comes down to cogs it comes down to you know economies of scale uh but there's a pushback you know consumers care now what they're consuming especially in the natural stores you won't even get into some of these stores if you're using some of these ingredients but yep. fundamentally for for us um we never back down on the belief that you can create a high quality product without these ingredients. And I think um, thus far, most businesses and most 
uh, I would say plant-based brands have been focused on two things, taste and taste first. Plant-based was, was V1 was taste. V2 was, was taste and texture. And what we've seen in CPG that we're mirroring now in plant-based, and hopefully we're paving the way, is health. So plant, taste, texture, taste, texture, taste, texture, and health. And, and, and health has been at the sacrifice of taste and texture, but we have to do better. Innovation is coming. You know, consumers are, are driving the growth in the category and they're looking for more. So it's no different than the space you're in and, and product that you sell or, or other phenomenal entrepreneurs paving the way. Um, we have to be responsible for not only providing palatability, but also health. And, and that's what's the long-term play here. Traditional businesses, they can't do what we do because what does it say about the rest of their company, right? You know, they can't say chicken is bad. What does it say about their, their, their billion dollar revenue business? And they can't say carriage and maldediction is bad because what does it say about their 50 SKUs on, on, on the shelf? So um, we're really p pigeonholing there and we feel like it's really something which our consumers are looking for. Yeah. And these brands, you know, these multinationals have built brands over cent or over uh, decades using those respective ingredients. So to kind of flip one year and say, eh, you know what? We're cleaning this up. Yes, they do it. They marginally innovate. But um, on top of that, you're looking at massive corporations with quarterly goals. Um, yeah. And, you know, for them to make a bet on a plant-based chicken, which probably is going to take two, three, five, ten years to kind yeah. of uh, realize any, you know, a real return and, and build something and invest in it, that short-term, uh, those short-term expectations aren't going to align. Yeah. Um, so from 2017 to you guys launched D2C April of this year, correct? <laughs> April this year, we pivoted into it pretty aggressively. You know, main channel was, was food service, you know, working with food service partners, QSR partners across the country. And we had a really extensive line, you know, um, we watched products before, like Beyond and Impossible successfully position themselves on menus strategically from the Mama Focus up to the Disney's and the Burger Kings. We've all seen yep. those launches. So um, that was your that was your initial launch strategy was was more you would would you argue impossible strategy versus a beyond initially at the outset? Yeah, I mean that's where the volume will come in in food service. You're looking at partnering with operators, you know, the Cisco's, the US Foods of, of the world and, and yeah. strategically positioning yourself on menu items and and that was for us going into this the the way forward initially. Partnering then with with select natural grocers, you know, Sprouts for us was an exclusive launch. We were testing supply chain. We were testing spins and data just to see, you know, uh, we, weren't re we weren't inventing a category, but we were challenging a category in chicken and clean label with a higher price point. So to, to go into seven, 800, 2000 retailers early on just was not an option for us. And we positioned ourselves in Sprouts. You'll know why natural, we got a great relationship with them. Um, and we launched with them in March. When COVID hit, you know, on so, the food service. Go ahead. Sorry, you go. No, just naturally when, no, the, no, food no. Service, when the food service business um, came to, I would say, a standstill, you know, like many entrepreneurs, you, you pivot um, and dot com seemed like something we were set up for and we launched at the end of April. By the way, your guys' D2C delivery, the box, the everything was amazing. For those of you who haven't, check this out. Amazing packaging. Little plug, the Cajun chicken. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Appreciate um, it. I, I will say, dude, as somebody who's who's in perishable D2C, the package, the execution for as early as you guys are was really well done. So Thank you. Um, check that out. But um, I guess here's another question for you. you. Would you say the reason that you went food service as opposed to a beyond meat strategy of going big wide was you wanted to perfect and maybe it's a capacity thing. Maybe it's a slower rollout versus going wide early. Was that kind of the, the thought process? Yeah, I mean reading understanding you know what's successful long term and long term is the word i'll emphasize here cpg yeah. brands are doing in the space is it comes down to data like we have to understand and have a compelling story um that allows us to to move into conventional retail and eventually one day larger box stores but um it was a blend it was a perfect blend of supply chain you know, um, also positioning yourself and having the capital to support launches. You know, we were still, you know, early on in our funding um, days. Um, and, and at the same time, um, we are relatively unknown. I mean, most people here probably listen to this probably still haven't heard of Daring. This might be the first time. So to position yourself at a 799 899 retail price, 
compared to, you know, a $5 when, yes, I can stand here and say we taste better and we're healthier, but without the marketing budget to support retail uh, sell-through, uh, we felt that that launch was, was the perfect strategy for us. Now, you know, today we launch into more stores. Next week we launch into more stores. And now we have the support that can emphasize. We're focused on natural this year. And we have some exciting conventional launches. But um, yeah, it's um, it's something which you obviously know a lot about. So was the company called something else before? And you guys were initially thinking about, okay, we're going to do this in the UK, correct? Yeah, it was. And so and Daring Foods, I mean, Daring.com, we're super proud of our domain. Um, but we, we've always been daring, daring in name and daring by nature, of course, um, with, with sort of challenging the status quo. But you know, we were in the UK, we were living there, we were testing the product there, we're iterating on the product there. But, you know, we we're un unapologetically ambitious as a company um, and couple that with the hundred pounds of, of, um, of, of animal, uh, you know, chicken that you guys eat here a year um, as a nation per person, uh, we always had the, the goal to come over to the US and, and tackle this industry. Now, naively, as a young aspiring entrepreneur, you think it's easier than it is. Um, <laughs> but we were fortunate to attract customers and investment in the US. So, you know, thankfully, someone was, was looking down and, and, and we were able to position ourselves and relaunch and, and also uh, set up the company in the US. And now we live here in LA uh, and run the company out of LA. So I'd love to transition a little bit into your globe. You're really like a global citizen. You have experience living all around the world. You know, I was I was lucky too. like a nut, the initial inspiration for Dream Pops. I lived in Milan for two years. And nice. a lot of that inspiration came from you know, the ice cream and gelato culture over yeah. in Italy and then just confection and the sweets and, and, and cafes. Um, a lot of that experience, I guess. Can you can you mention kind of uh, the benefits of living in Dubai? And, you know, you're from Scotland. Um, you know, how do you think that translates to what you guys have been able to kind of build and manifest with Daring? <clears throat> yeah, great question. And both me and my co-founder, I mean, he lived in Korea and Paris and, and in the UK and now here. I think fundamentally, you know, brands have to understand their consumer, you know, living in different cultures, understanding how different people do business. So though we are focused on the U.S. market, you know, one day we would like to scale our, our business, you know, overseas. But fundamentally, you know, living both in, you know, in Paris, the U.K., the Middle East and now here, we've, we've been able to see and understand different um and i will say there's nowhere like the us but we've been able to see different brands different cultures different food trends um and understand how different retailers and distributors work in different countries so we were very fortunate that we had a lot of early uh, i would say conversations in the uk so coming here we had a pretty good understanding of how business was run through the channels we operate so you know, it, it teaches you a lot as a person as well, living living away from home. And, you know, I'm, I'm an immigrant here in this country and, 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 and it's exciting to be here. But, you know, um, it, it makes you grow up pretty fast. Yep. And global ambitions, once you've kind of built the successful business here, would you want to bring it overseas, uh, whether it's Asia, back to Europe? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, you, you, you know, we have we have our long term goals. But I think one of the most important things is to stay laser like focused on where you are today. You know, you can you can get emails and you can get distribution offers every single day to take it. But, you know, we, we got to build this sustainably and ethically and we've got to build this right. So right now, I'm purely focused on the U.S. market. I mean, the U.S., chicken consumption if we do that right you know we have a we have a big business so one day yes but not in the near future and can we talk a little bit about you as an outsider looking in on america's consumption of animal products it's very different how you just look at ingredient labels in europe or in asia um what you know and you don't need to <laughs> attack u.s culture i know we're not you know necessarily pioneers in how we do our uh you know kind of think about the products that we're, you know, giving to U.S. consumers. But, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the poultry industry and your thoughts on how Daring can really proactively, uh, you know, this is really, uh, what you guys are doing is really, frankly, changing the world and the landscape of, of overall food culture and food consumption. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on how, you know, you really, uh, the broader vision here and mission. Yeah, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good question. And, you know, 
our North Star is is very singular. We want to remove chicken from the food system. It's a very daunting challenge. You know, that's why we're called Daring. Um, but I think fundamentally what it comes down to is, is, is a lot of education. You know, most of us were raised on chicken. It's been a staple in our meals for years, a standard in school cafeterias, a late night go-to. Fried chicken is such an integral part of our culture, both in the U.S. and worldwide, but particular here. But it's a cheap, you know, tasty, but omnipresent protein. We've never looked at it twice as, as a protein until we did. Um, and when we looked closer, we found, you know, a harsh reality, which too many people were unaware of. It's an industry that is unsustainable both for the animals and, and our welfare. Um, but we have begged people to stop eating animals for decades. We've, we've, we animal rights uh, activists, global health experts, they've made some compelling, you know, case studies on why we should be reducing our meat intake. But the reason we haven't fundamentally is because it tastes really, really, really good. The peel, the flake, the bite, the experience around sharing that fried chicken with your partner or your friends and dipping it in trough, whatever it may be. Um, it's a very enjoyable experience. So what we have to do is we have to educate and give people a product which is absolutely no sacrifice on their favorite protein. So yes, we, we, we believe that there's, there's a better way, but at the same time, we are appreciative and understanding of why everyone loves chicken so much. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really just, um, it's really a challenge that we're taking on head first, but fundamentally we're, we're, we're focused on chicken. You know, that's, that's our lane. That's where we want to, we want to lead. Um, and that's where all the innovation is going behind. I love it, man. I think, you know, you know, when you meet other founders who have these massive like missions and visions, and <laughs> look, I'm, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very excited just about what you guys are building and just so much opportunity in, in front of you. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's really, really exciting. Um, I guess, you know, as we kind of kind of tail this wrap, wrap things up and I want to be cognizant of your time, a couple of things I'd love to note. Um, a lot of founders that tune in, they want to go start and build a food and beverage company. They want to go after this daring or exciting uh, idea. Any tips or advice you've built companies in the past? Where do you even get started if you want to get into the food and beverage industry? Um, where do you get started? I, I, there probably isn't a specific place. You know, I immersed myself and I think my co-founder Ellie would say the same just in you know businesses like there's never enough information out there take what you will but podcasts like this books pod studies you know articles on medium you know next there's so much information out there by some really compelling challenging brands that are disrupting industries uh, my advice thus far I think patience would be the number one thing you know, businesses take a long time. Brands take a long time to build. You know, the success stories and the IPOs and the, the exits that, you know, most people chase. You know, when you look back in incorporation, it's been 10, 15, 20 years. You know, uh, we plan so far ahead in CPG where you're six, seven, eight, 12, 16 months out from a launch. Uh, it takes time, but understanding your customer, understanding your value proposition is fundamental. Um, and honestly, there's never been a better time to, I think, launch a company. Uh, it's, 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 it's an amazing space to be in. Couldn't agree with you more. It's like you look at the Oatleys or the Calafias or some of these massive conglomerates, right? 20 years in the making, 30 years. In the, like it's, it's wild. Yeah. It's really easy to chase headlines. And a lot of these headlines people need to know are an illusion, are not yeah, the reality, are the yeah. 0.01% and oftentimes not real. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, you know, for you that, you know, this is a really challenging business when you're like, you know, feeling, um, it, it really is about persistence and patience, but anything yeah. that you do, um, outside of work or just to keep that balance and to stay driven when you might, you know, think things, when things get bleak or, you know, are on, yeah. on the edge. Yeah. Work-life balance is something I'm, I'm still figuring out. Um, but you know, uh, it stems back to my original days of, 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 uh, of keeping fit. My, me, Elliot, some of the other team members, we, 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 we ride bikes. We were here in LA, we rode bike, you know, three, four times a week. We go out into the Topanga and the Malibus and, and we get away. It's super important that you find that. I think you can get caught up in the seven day a week. You've got to hustle, aren't you? Like you've got to work hard. It's a very, 
glorified like no days off mentality but fundamentally you know um you, you got to take care of yourself first for a longevity in business so yeah i think um personally and it's not for everyone that just keeping 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 sane and, and moving and staying healthy is is integral to the longevity of any uh any business love that man well we're gonna have to go for uh just hop on the bike because i'm, I'm yes, very sir. game for that <laughs> yes sir no we'll have to connect you're in you're in venice is that right yeah what about awesome. you uh, Culver City, Mar Vista, so not far. Uh, awesome, man. Super close. Perfect. Well, dude, just to end it, you know, what, what can we expect to see from Daring? You guys have a ton of growth going. Um, anything that you want to plug or share with, uh, you know, what's, what's coming out uh, with, with, with the company? Uh, yeah, never, never afraid of a plug. But, um, you know, new stores launching in, in, in the LA area uh, this week, next week, Gelson's, uh, Bristol Farms, Air One in, in November 1st. But our, our new exciting product, which is uh, is launching uh, next week, um, breaded product. It's not a nugget, first of the kind, has all the all the uh, century experiences that you would expect from fried chicken, but obviously 100% plant based. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm excited to to to, to bring that to the consumers. I, I'm not sure if we sent you any, but we'll have to. Um, I've got them. I've got yeah. them in my freezer. Unbelievable. Con con <laughs> yeah, con continuous growth. Um, and yeah, uh, looking forward to just striving on. Well, Ross, thank you so much for making the time, man. I'm you know blown away. I, I think you guys are onto something massive here. Um, everyone expect to see see daring in every freezer around the country. Um, thank you again for making some time. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, look, I'm, I. Uh, I, I really, I see this being a, a really impactful company over the next few years. And uh, yeah, really, really excited to, to jump on with you. So appreciate it, sir. Thanks for having me. We'll, uh, we'll touch base soon. All right. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye.